It can paint a masterpiece in the style of Rembrandt. It can write a poem that brings a tear to your eye. It can defeat the most brilliant strategic minds on the planet in games of unimaginable complexity. It doesn't breathe, it doesn't sleep, and it doesn't have a body. So what is it? I don't know what it is. This isn't a riddle from a distant future. It's the reality of artificial intelligence today. We interact with it every time we unlock our phones with our faces, ask a virtual assistant for the weather, or get a movie recommendation that feels just right. But this powerful, invisible force didn't just appear out of nowhere. It was born from a simple, audacious question asked over 75 years ago. A question that would set humanity on a course to create its own intellectual successor. And to understand how we got from a philosophical question to a world-altering technology, we have to go back to the very beginning, to the mind of a man who dared to ask, can machines think? The story of modern AI begins not in a gleaming tech lab, but in the mind of a British mathematician and codebreaker, Alan Turing. Alan Turing, who possessed perhaps one of the greatest mathematical minds of the 20th century. Turing was a mathematician, cryptographer, and pioneer of computer science. Turing conceived of a hypothetical machine that reads symbols on a strip of tape, rewriting or deleting them based on a finite set of rules. In fact, originally, Turing described a person slavishly performing these operations. He called this person the computer. Given a problem to compute, this machine would either stop and give you the answer, or run forever if the answer doesn't exist. In 1950, fresh off his incredible work breaking the Enigma code during World War II, Turing published a paper titled Computing Machinery and Intelligence. In it, he sidestepped the fuzzy philosophical debate of what thinking truly is and proposed a practical test instead. He called it the imitation game. Imagine a human judge sitting at a computer terminal, having two separate text conversations. One is with another human, the other is with a machine. The judge's job is to figure out which is which. If the judge can't reliably tell the machine apart from the human, Turing argued, then for all practical purposes, the machine has demonstrated intelligence. This idea, now famously known as the Turing test, became the foundational goalpost for the entire field. Just six years later, in the summer of 1956, a group of brilliant minds gathered at Dartmouth College for what they called the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence. This was the event that officially christened the field. The proposal for the workshop was brimming with optimism, stating a bold conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. They believe that in a single summer, they could make significant headway on getting machines to use language, form concepts, and even improve themselves. The early years were a whirlwind of excitement. Programs were created that could solve algebra problems, prove geometric theorems, and even play checkers. The future seemed incredibly bright. It looks bright. But the pioneers of AI were about to discover that the road from simple problem solving to true intelligence was far longer and more difficult than they ever imagined, leading the field into a long, cold period of doubt and disappointment. The initial golden years of AI were fueled by big promises. Researchers told funding agencies that machines with the intelligence of a human being were just a decade or two away. But reality proved much more complicated. The computers of the time were simply not powerful enough to handle the sheer complexity of the real world. A program that could solve a self-contained logic puzzle was a world away from a machine that could understand the nuance of human language or navigate a cluttered room. As the promised breakthroughs failed to materialize, the funding dried up. This period, from the mid-1970s to the early 1980s, became known as the first AI winter. The term was deliberately chosen to echo the concept of a nuclear winter, a time of cold, bleak stagnation where research progress froze. But as the winter thawed, a new, more practical approach to AI began to blossom. Expert systems. Instead of trying to create a machine that could think about anything like a human, researchers focused on building systems that could mimic the decision-making of a human expert in one specific area. Think of a digital geologist that could help identify mineral deposits, or a medical program that could analyze symptoms to suggest a diagnosis. These systems were built on a knowledge base of facts, 
and if-then rules painstakingly gathered from human experts. For example, an engine repair system might have a rule like, if the engine won't crank and the lights are dim, then check the battery. These expert systems were among the first truly successful and commercially viable forms of AI, and they sparked a new boom in the 1980s. They were powerful, but they had a critical limitation. They couldn't learn. Their knowledge was fixed, hand-coded by programmers. For AI to take the next leap, it had to move beyond simply following rules. It had to learn to beat us at our own games. For centuries, the game of chess has been the ultimate symbol of human intellect and strategic thought. So, it was the perfect arena to test the growing power of machine intelligence. The ultimate showdown came in 1997. In one corner, the reigning world chess champion, Garry Kasparov, a man considered by many to be the greatest player in history. In the other, a machine from IBM named Deep Blue. Deep Blue was a computational monster. It could evaluate 200 million chess positions every single second. A year earlier, Kasparov had defeated a previous version of the machine, but in the 1997 rematch, the world watched in stunned silence as Kasparov, after a tense six-game match, was defeated. A machine had conquered the king of games. It was a symbolic moment that sent shockwaves through the public consciousness. AI wasn't just a lab experiment anymore. It had arrived. But for AI researchers, an even greater challenge loomed. The ancient game of Go. While chess is computationally complex, Go is a game of intuition, pattern recognition, and abstract strategy. The number of possible moves in Go is greater than the number of atoms in the known universe. A brute force approach like Deep Blues would never work. For years, Go was considered the holy grail, a game that machines would not be able to master for another century. That all changed in 2016. A program called AlphaGo, developed by Google's DeepMind, challenged Lee Sedol, the world's top Go player. Unlike Deep Blue, AlphaGo hadn't just been programmed with rules. It had learned the game by analyzing millions of human matches and then playing against itself millions more times, developing strategies no human had ever conceived. In a match that captivated the world, AlphaGo defeated Lee Sedol four games to one. During game two, AlphaGo made a move, move 37, that was so unexpected, so alien, that experts initially thought it was a mistake. But it turned out to be a stroke of creative genius that secured the win. AI had not only mastered our logic, it was now demonstrating something akin to intuition. But this incredible leap forward was only possible because of a revolution happening behind the scenes. A revolution powered by two things, massive amounts of data and a new way of learning. What made AlphaGo so different from Deep Blue? The answer is a subfield of AI called Deep Learning. At its core, deep learning is inspired by the structure of the human brain. It uses artificial neural networks with many layers, hence the name deep, to learn from vast amounts of data. Instead of a programmer writing explicit rules, the network learns to recognize patterns on its own. Think of it like this. To teach an old expert system to recognize a cat, you'd have to write rules like, if it has pointy ears and whiskers and fur, then it's a cat. But what about a cat with folded ears or a hairless cat? The rules would quickly break down. With deep learning, you don't write rules. You just show the neural network millions of pictures labeled cat. The network then learns, layer by layer, to identify the features that define a cat on its own. From simple edges and colors in the first layers, to more complex concepts like eyes and snouts, until the final layer can confidently say, cat. This approach requires two key ingredients, enormous computing power and even more enormous amounts of data. The data problem was a huge bottleneck for years, until a computer scientist named Fei-Fei Li had a groundbreaking idea. 
In 2007, she and her team began a project called ImageNet. Their goal was to create a massive, free database of millions of images, all meticulously labeled by humans, to be used to train AI systems. ImageNet was the fuel that ignited the deep learning revolution. Suddenly, researchers had the data they needed to build and test powerful new models. This led to the explosion of AI we saw in the 2010s. Facial recognition on your phone, virtual assistants like Siri and Alexa that understand your voice, and even self-driving cars. AI could now see and hear the world with stunning accuracy. But the next step was even more ambitious. To move from just recognizing content to creating it. For most of its history, AI was primarily analytical. It could classify an image, translate text, or predict an outcome. But in the early 2020s, a new type of AI burst into the mainstream. Generative AI. And it changed everything. The breakthrough came with the development of massive large language models, or LLMs. In 2020, a company called OpenAI released GPT-3, a model with 175 billion parameters, trained on a colossal amount of text and code from the internet. The results were astonishing. GPT-3 could write essays, generate computer code, summarize long documents, and answer complex questions with remarkable fluency. Then, in late 2022, OpenAI released ChatGPT to the public, and the world was never the same. It became the fastest growing app in history, reaching 100 million users in just two months. For the first time, anyone could have a conversation with a powerful AI, asking it to write a poem, plan a vacation, or explain quantum physics. At the same time, similar models were being developed for images. Tools like DALI and Midjourney could generate breathtakingly realistic or fantastical images from a simple text description. Want to see a photorealistic astronaut riding a horse on Mars? The AI could create it in seconds. This new generative era has unlocked incredible creative potential. But it has also brought us face to face with some of the most profound and difficult questions about this technology. As AI becomes more powerful and integrated into our lives, we have to confront its dual nature. The immense good it can do, the potential harm it could cause, and the truly unsettling possibilities that lie on the horizon. No technology is inherently good or evil, but AI's potential for both is staggering. The good is all around us and growing every day. In healthcare, AI is helping doctors diagnose diseases like cancer earlier and more accurately than ever before. It's accelerating the discovery of new life-saving drugs and personalizing treatments for individual patients. It's helping scientists model climate change with greater precision and designing more efficient energy systems. The bad is just as real. One of the most immediate concerns is job displacement. A recent study found up to 670,000 U.S. jobs were lost to robots between 1990 and 2007, and that number is likely to go up. A widely cited study from 2013 found nearly half of all jobs in the U.S. are in danger of being automated over the next 20 years. Occupations that require repetitive and predictable tasks in transportation, logistics, and administrative support were especially high risk. As AI automates more tasks, from customer service to data analysis, what happens to the people who used to do those jobs? Another major issue is bias. AI systems learn from data created by humans, and that data contains our societal biases. If an AI is trained on historical hiring data where men were favored for leadership roles, the AI will learn to be biased against female candidates. This can create a dangerous feedback loop, embedding discrimination into our technological infrastructure. Then there are the massive privacy implications of facial recognition and constant surveillance. And finally, there's the ugly, the more dystopian, existential risks that keep scientists and ethicists up at night. The rise of deep fakes and AI-generated misinformation threatens our ability to tell what's real, potentially destabilizing society and democracy. The development of fully autonomous weapons, killer robots, that can make life or death decisions without human intervention poses a terrifying new threat to global security. And the ultimate question, one raised by figures like the late Stephen Hawking, is what happens when we create an intelligence that is vastly superior to our own? 
Could a superintelligence see humanity as an obstacle? These are no longer questions for science fiction. They are urgent challenges that we need to address as we design the future of this technology. From Alan Turing's imitation game to the global phenomenon of ChatGPT, the evolution of AI has been a story of relentless human ingenuity. We have successfully embarked on the quest to create non-biological intelligence. Now, we stand at a critical juncture. The technology is evolving faster than ever, and its impact on our world will only grow. The path forward is fraught with both incredible promise and profound peril. In a sign of the times, governments are now beginning to act, with frameworks like the European Union's AI Act representing the first comprehensive attempt to regulate the technology and mitigate its risks. The choices we make in the coming years as developers, as policymakers, and as a society will determine whether AI becomes a tool for unprecedented progress and prosperity or something far more dangerous. The story of AI is no longer just about the evolution of a technology. It is now fundamentally intertwined with the story of our own. If you found this look into the evolution of AI fascinating, be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more deep dives into the technologies shaping our world. Thanks for watching.